Okay, so wel welcome back everybody for the second class of the Metadynamics lecture. And this time, so I apologize for last time, but uh, I couldn't be there, but Garrett did a great job in very many ways. So thanks Garrett, wherever you are. And this time we will do the corrections. I hope that you at least attempt to do some of the exercises. And uh, some of them, the last couple of ones were really kind of free that you have to devise a solution and, and play with, uh, with your imagination. And we will, uh, if, if you want to share when we get there, your, um, your attempts, even if you failed is, a, is not a problem, just to, to be a, a bit more interactive. And um, I, that would be very, very nice. Otherwise, uh, uh, what I've done, uh, like uh, my first lesson, I prepare a, a notebook with a solution, which is now kind of incomplete. So we will uh, go through all the exercises together and I will try to, to complete on the fly and, and to, to do the, all the exercises together. So let me try to share the screen. Hopefully it works. Can you see it? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. So last, uh, this class is about metadynamics, how to uh, uh, set up a metadynamic simulation, how to run it, how to analyze the results. So we will insist always on the same, uh, one important topic is how to evaluate the convergence of your simulation and how to uh, compute free energies from the metadynamic simulation and the associated error. And we will, uh, uh, use tools that have been uh, used before, like block uh, uh, error analysis, and in the context of a metadynamic simulation. But the, most of the theory, and in, as far as the error is concerned, is the one that you saw with Garrett already, and uh, with Giovanni, if I'm not mistaken. So let's go through the material together, and um, hopefully at least you download uh, and install the software correctly. If you had problems, please, uh, just tell me if you encounter any problem in, uh, in setting up uh, the software uh, via Conda. <clears throat> and the exercises, all the material was on our GitHub for this specific lecture. And um, uh, so you have to download the GitHub and, and we are basically ready to go. I will upload in this GitHub the notebook of a solution one, once this lecture is, uh, is finished. <clears throat> Okay, so we start with a very simple system that you already seen multiple times, which is analin dipeptide. It's a very simple system, yet it has some complexity of a, of a real system, which means there are some degrees of freedom which are very slow to equilibrate. So if you run a standard MD simulation, probably you get trapped in these states for, for a very long time. So the idea of, of the first exercise is to familiarize a bit with the system, if you're not familiar already. And, uh, uh, so we will do two um, standard molecular dynamic simulation, starting from two different uh, metal stable states of RNA dipeptide. So I've prepared uh, the topology files for Gromax, it's called TPR file, to start the simulation from one basin or from the other basin. In the two basins are mostly uh, can be identified by different value, values of the phi dihedral angle. So, uh, I, here I wrote the command, uh, how to, to run the simulation. This is standard MD. And after doing this, I can anticipate that we will use plumed in post-processing mode as we use in lecture one to calculate the value of the two backbone dihedral phi psi during these two simulations. So we will prepare two input files for plumed uh, by completing this, uh, this template. And then here, we will analyze the two trajectories and calculate the value of phi psi during the simulation. So let's do this together. I actually run already the simulation because it, otherwise it takes too much time. But, oh, sorry, let's go to the top. So what we do, we import some modules. And then I use this trick to, uh, to set the working directory in, on my laptop and to check if everything is okay, I'm printing both with a bash command and a Python command uh, the location. So we are in the right uh, folder. <clears throat> and what we do, we create for each exercise a separate directory as we did before. So this is all, all this is a bash um, 
shell basically so you can run any type of, of bash common inside the python notebook and what we need to complete is this plumed input file and uh, what we want to do is calculate phi and psi so you know there is a way to do this very quickly which is to specify a pdb file of which i don't remember the path so we are here in exercise one so we probably want to go into data dialanin and here there are two pdb files so i just cut and paste the path and here the structure is let me double check again diala a.pdb okay so it will read a, a pdb file of the system so it, a plume can understand the topology of the system that there are uh, amino acids and you can use some special keywords for example to select phi and psi we can simply use this syntax phi of residue 2 which is the central residue and psi of residue 2 perfect then we want to print the value of this collective variable on in our two simulations so we these are called phi and psi on a file corval every step. Perfect. Once we prepare this input file, we can, I, I created two subdirectories, one in which I run the simulation starting from A, 20 nanoseconds, the second one starting from B. Uh, once the simulation is done, I will use the driver to uh, analyze the, uh, the simulation, calculate phi and psi. So now the simulation are actually done. So these lines are, are, are commented, but we will do the analysis, the plume and driver together. So this should be pretty fast. No, there is already an error. Ah, yes, of course, the path is not this, but this is one more. Perfect. No, it means that the, the LAB is not there, I think. Uh, no, I was I was making a mistake because I, I put the re relative path with respect to exercise one, but actually the simulation and, and the analysis are done in, in, in the subdirectory run A and run B. So I had to add uh, another um, two dot and a slash to get to the to the location of the PDB. Is it clear? It's just a stupid mistake here. So if if you if you look at the output, you see that. That this is for a run A done, and then for run B is done. Okay, this is because the, the directory exists already. So I can use it, doesn't matter if it's run A or run B, I can use the same PDB for the two. The system is the same. Here is just to learn about the topology of the system. So it doesn't matter about uh, the initial conformation. But the two simulations are uh, initiated from uh, the two different states. Topple A and topple B. Is it is it clearer? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now we should have an output which is called Colver file in the two directories, run A and run B. What we want to do, if I remember correctly the exercise, we want to uh, plot uh, the um, uh, extent of uh, phi psi uh, exploration in the two runs. So I can create a plot when I, in which I visualize just the points in the five size space for run A and from run B. And then there is a, let's, let's start with this. Okay, so I color them differently. This is a blue run A and orange run B. As you can see, these uh, two simulation stays in two completely different parts of the conformational space of uh, RNA type peptide. And they, um, they never uh, uh, pass from one basin to, in, to another. In 20 nanoseconds, this is uh, not possible. So it would take much longer to, to explore all the conformational states of alanine tepeptide. That's why we need uh, uh, metadynamics. And then what I did also in preparation of the exercise two, I follow the instruction, I calculate calculated the fluctuation, the standard deviation of the two collective variables in the different basins visited. Why am I doing this? Because uh, when we do metadynamics, you know, we add this Gaussian potential uh, on the fly during the simulation. So we add this Gaussian and we have to decide some parameters. One parameter is the width of the Gaussian. And typically the width of the Gaussian is chosen to be 
of the same, let's say, uh, um, size of the, of the basin you are visiting or you will visit. Of course, each basin has its own shape, so we cannot really choose a sigma which is optimal for every basin. There will be narrow basin, large basins, so we take something intermediate and, and, and right for, for all of them. So I calculate from run A and run B the fluctuation here, the standard deviation in phi, uh, just in phi, because the metadynamics will be in phi. So in this is in radians, more or less the fluctuation. So uh, this is something very quick. Remember, this is a periodic variable. So we are lucky that it stays here and is not jumping from uh, uh, not, not, not a lot from the, from the boundaries. Otherwise, the fluctuation uh, calculated like this or the average value uh, doesn't make a lot of sense because the, va the variable is periodic. So you have to be careful. In, in this case, it just stays here and stays there. So it's, 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 it's reasonable. <coughs> Did you complete all of you this exercise? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So let's go back to the instruction. Are both simulations long enough to visit all the relevant conformational states? No, they remain trapped in different regions of the five size space. Okay, so this is pretty clear that we need to do something to, to be able to explore all these states. And what we will do, what we choose is metadynamics. And we pass directly to exercise two, which hopefully you all complete. Okay, in exercise two, we, we, we do our first metadynamic simulation using one collective variable, which is beta hydra phi. So we need to complete this input file. And in this input file, what is missing is again, the definition of phi psi and the parameter uh, of metadynamics, really how to activate metadynamics. Let's go back to the, <clears throat> to the notebook. So here I just copy this thing. Now we have, we are in exercise two. So this should be correct, finally. So we do with phi and we do with psi. Perfect. Now activate well-tempered metadynamics and the argument, the collective variable is, is phi. So you have to go into the manual, manual and look at the keyword, which is meta D. The argument is phi. And then we have some continuation points because the line of meta D is, is split over multiple lines. So we have to tell Plumed, don't stop here reading, but you have to read all the, all the next lines until the other dots here. Now we have some parameters that I gave you uh, like uh, uh, already, which are the pace. So this uh, every, how many time step, how fast we, uh, how often we deposit the bias of metadynamics. And this is typically what we do is to add a Gaussian every one picosecond. So these are 500 steps. So it's one picosecond. And the high is typical of the order of half KBT or something like this. This works well for, for a huge class of biological uh, problems where we don't have super high barriers or like chemical reaction or, or things like that. And the bias factor is, as, uh, as, as Garrett told you in the, in the theory lesson, should be chosen to be, to be commensurate with the typical barrier in your, in your problem. So the bias factor determines how fast the is high is decreasing in time. If this is too small, it will decrease too fast and you, you, you will not cross high bar barrier and vice versa. So again, there are some, uh, let's say, rules, rules of thumb for biological uh, problems uh, around eight or 10 or 12 in this regime, it should work pretty well. You can think of EVs as a ratio between this temperature of the CVs, we are sampling the CVs as the higher temperature, effectively, and the temperature of the system. So this is eight times the temperature of the system. And then here we put an estimate of the Gaussian width um, based on the fluctuation in the, in the unbiased run. So I actually don't remember, so let me, because I did this exercise, I don't remember 
the value I put. So I, 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 I spy on the his file and I put 0 0.3, which is probably something in between 0 0.55 and 0 0.14. Did you, did you choose uh, similar values in your exercise? Yes, no? Yes. Okay. Somebody used something completely different, like two or 0 0.0001? No. Good. Uh, finally, we have to print the two collective variables by psi every 10 steps, which will be a lot. Good. Now we have completed our input file and we can run the simulation. And, and you see that the difference between running standard MD and running, running metadynamics is just that you add a flag to Gromax, which activates plumed and, read, and reads the plumed.dat input file. Of course, you can call it whatever you want with file. Uh, and we, we call it simply plumed.dat. So we run this metadynamic simulation. And I did it already. So you have two files in the output in exercise two, which are the usual corner file, and then a new file called ILS file. Let me make this bigger. Um, so ILS files is a list, uh, you can see it here, is a list of Gaussian deposited during the simulation. So this is the time step. This is the, the position in phi space of a Gaussian, the sigma parameter, the hills high and the bias factor. So everything is, is, uh, is noted in these um, hills files that will be used for post-processing. So this is, is very quick actually to run. It's a couple of minutes probably, but I did it already. So we, we can spend time on the analysis. So we did that, we run, and now we have a look. Let me see at the question. So we completed. We create two, input, two output files, Colver and ILS. Now the question is, let's visualize the time series of the two collective variables and inspect the behavior of the two collective variables. And what are the differences between the previous trajectory, trajectories? So what, we, what I'm doing here is reading the Colver file and plotting uh, uh, time versus the value of phi. I'm plotting this just at the beginning because otherwise it is not very clear the plot. So just the first 200,000 points. As, as you can see, the, the behavior is, is, is very different with respect to the first uh, situation. Uh, in the sense that the system starts in one of the basin at zero, it, it visits the basin and then it jumps immediately in the second state, which is at phi equal to one. If you don't believe me, let's go here. So it stays here between minus three and minus one, and then it jumps in the other state that it was, that wasn't visited uh, before. So here we are, this is visiting the second state, and then it goes back to the previous basin, and it, then it starts uh, basically diffusing in the entire uh, phi uh, space. If I remove this limit, actually, maybe I can print every 100 or so. You can see that after a while, it, it's just diffusing in the entire file space. This is always a good sign that is not trapped in one part of your conformational space. Uh, if you want to compare visually this simulation with the previous one, we can plot phi versus psi for the old metadynamic simulation and from this one. No? And this is the difference. As you can see, in meta D, you visit both basins. In the, um, in the old MD, you visit just one. In this case, I, I selected just, let me see if I have still data B somewhere. Let's try MD A. And then I have MD B. Okay, so you see the difference. Uh, before it you were trapped in one of the two basins, and now with meta D you go back and forth repeatedly uh, between the two basins. Did you observe this behavior in your simulation? All of you? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. So this is something already that makes us happy that the system is not trapped anymore in the in these uh, in these states and that, that is visiting a larger conformational space. Good. Uh, let's proceed. At this point, we have stopped the simulation, but we don't know if the simulation is converging, if we need to run for longer. So we, we, we will try to assess this in the next few minutes. The first thing that we want to have a look is at the estimate of the free energy, which is calculated from this list of Gaussian, Gaussians. So if you, if you remember Garrett uh, lectures, the advantage of metadynamics is that it, you have a push from the Gaussian to, to, to jump and visit different conformational states <clears throat> and free energy basins, but also the list of Gaussians uh, at the end of the simulation, if you, if you integrate, if you sum this Gaussian, you have an estimate of a free energy profile because the Gaussian are filling the underlying uh, profile. And when you, when you collect them and you sum them in each point, you will have an estimate of a free energy. So this is what we are going to do. And we have a tool to do this, which is called sum its, which is summing the Gaussians. And here you can see what are the possible uh, parameters for this code. Okay, what we, what, what we do is something, let me check exactly, is something that will help us understanding the convergence and judging the convergence of a simulation. We don't do this operation once, that we calculate at the end of the simulation the free energy. We keep monitoring during the simulation what the estimate of the free energy if we sum the Gaussian up to that point. So every, let's say 200, uh, <coughs> every 200 uh, Gaussian, uh, we calculate uh, the estimate of a free energy with the Gaussian deposited up to that point. So it's a list that is growing, growing, growing. And we, and we visualize all this estimate of a free energy as a function of simulation time. Let me do this. So this probably I have to do it myself. Yes. So we compute the free energy as a function of simulation time from the Hills file every 200 Gaussians. And since the free energies are defined uh, by a, uh, an arbitrary offset, we align all the free energy to have a minimum value at zero. So it's easier to, to look at them. Okay, let's see how fast it's going to be. It's reading. You see every 200 Gaussian is saying I'm, I'm, I'm printing on file with free energy and so on and so forth. You sh we should have around 100 files. Okay, and done. You can check now you, we have in exercise uh, two, 100 estimate of a free energy as a function of time. So we want to plot all of them. And I, I, I do this, this very easy loop in, in Python to plot one every 10, so it's easier to, to visualize. Uh, and we pot, plot the, the phi, the free energy, which is called like this. In, if, you, if you open the, the beginning of this file, so let's do ahead of the uh, first one, um, you will see that uh, the fields are phi and phi dot free, which is the free energy. So the second column is the free energy. If you ask, if you if you wonder what is the third column, is the derivative of a free energy with respect to phi, but we don't use it. And we use just the first and the second column. So we plot this uh, as a function of time. And this is more or less what, what you obtain. So the quality is not super big. Uh, so the, this one is the first estimate. When you, observe, when you have done a few jumps between state, so you don't get the barrier right up to this point. But as the simulation uh, continues, you see that you, you start uh, having a consistent estimate of a free energy as a function of simulation time. So this is another good sign. We have two up to now. The first one is the system is exploring repeatedly all the states. The second one is the estimate of the free energy from the bias potential, so from the, from the deposit it is, is not changing over time. So this already is a good indication 
that the simulation probably, probably is converged. Now, here I gave you a suggestion because it's very, sometimes it's not easy to, to just over, over look at, at 100 uh, profile uh, in, um, in, in one image. So what we usually do is we focus on the important part of the, of the landscape. Here it's very simple, we have two states. So what we want to calculate is the free energy difference between the two states and evaluate this free energy difference as a function of simulation time. This is, a, let's say, a quick way to, to, to look at all these profiles together. We just quantify the free energy of the basins. So how do you calculate the free energy of these basins from this plot? Any idea why I drink some water? Um, we have done that by computing the relative populations in, in previous exercises. Okay, so how do you calculate the population from this plot? You, you calculate the uh, um, probabilities as a function of phi um, by doing minus kt log F or am I wait the other way around? Perfect. Um, and uh, then you integrate. So you, you make you, you choose your boundaries on the peaks and you integrate. Perfect. So this, the, there is a relation between the probability and the free energy. The probability of, of having a certain value of the CV is the exponential of minus the free energy divided by KBT. And then the probability of staying in a range of a collective variable, it means the collective variable has certain values. For example, between minus three and minus one, it can be all the values in this range. So the probability of staying here is you, you stay in, in one point or in the other point or in the other point. So you integrate the probability density. And this is what I do here up to now, up to here. So basically, I cycle over all the files. I read again the free energy. I also find the minimum value. And then uh, I, from the, I, I have to scan for each file, I have to scan the free energy profile. So this is a second loop over the free energy profile, over each free energy profile. I take the value of phi in this point and I calculate the probability from the free energy. So probability is exponential of minus the free energy divided by KBT. Now, what I do here is a simple trick that I, I, I align them. I, I try to minimize, let's say, the, the risk of, of some numerical problems when you deal with exponential. So this is just to make the exponential behave correctly. And then <clears throat> this probability is per point. What I do, I sum. Uh, depending on the value of phi. If phi is between minus three and minus one, I, I, I accumulate in this F0, which will be the free energy in, in the first basin. Otherwise, if it, phi between 0 0.5 and 1.5, I accumulate the value of the probability in F1. Okay, up to this point, we have a probability of staying in one basin and the other for each free energy profile. And then it's very easy. You go back to the free energy by taking minus KBT, the logarithm of the ratio between this probability. Because the logarithm of the ratio is the difference between the two logarithms. So the difference between the free energies. And this is the delta in free energy between the two basins. And that I save in, a, in this case in a, in, a, in a Python list. And then the only thing that I do is to plot at the end because I accumulate this for every, as a function of simulation time and I plot it. So if you did that, you should see something like this. Did you try? No. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Okay. And this is what you observe. The behavior like this. Um, the free energy difference uh, be, with me goes to 14 between A and B. 14? Yes. Did you define these, uh, these uh, ranges in a very different uh, way compared to me? 
No, I don't think so. But maybe there is a mistake somewhere in my code, so I'll check. Should be around 10 because you can see by uh, with your eyes because it should be more or less the difference between these points and this point. So it should be around 10. This is something more sophisticated than just measuring the, the difference between these two points and this one, which is around 10. Okay, I will have, uh, you should have a quick look and then see if something that, that okay, you missed. Will do. But this is a bit more easier to, 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 to understand that more or less this, this difference in free energy between the two states is, is kind of constant for most of the simulation around minus 10. Okay, good. So now we are in, in position to do a more sophisticated analysis of convergence. We can, uh, I, I, if I do this in real life on a real system, at this point, I would stop the simulation and do the analysis that, that we are going to do because there are good signs of, of a convergence of your simulation, all the good signs. To quantify better the convergence, what we need to do is to calculate an error in the, in the, um, in the, in the free energy uh, that we are estimated from metadynamics. To do this, uh, first, we, we have to talk, as Garrett already did multiple times, about how to reweight or unbias a metadynamic simulation. So the fact you know very well that when you add something to your simulation beside your force field, so any bias potential, you are changing the underlying ensemble that you, will, you are assembling in your simulation. So you're not interested in the, at the end of the day, and the, at the properties in this modified ensemble, you are interested in the properties in the of original ensemble. So in this case of the, of the force field. So you have to do something on the statistics that is produced by molecular dynamic to recover the, the correct, the actual ensemble. And this is called reweighting. And there are, uh, Garrett mentioned, several ways to uh, reweight a metadynamic simulation. And the, the difference, between metadynamics and umbrella sampling is that the bias of metadynamics is this sum of Gaussian which change over time. It's not a static bias, but it's time dependent. And this makes um, the reweighting a bit more complicated. So that's why there are several methods to do it. Here we use a very, very, very simple method, which is uh, assuming what is not true, that the bias is not changing over time, which is a static bias. This is true with well-tempered metadynamics, as long as your simulation is long enough, because we know that the his of his Gaussian are going slowly to zero, which means that the functional form of the bias is not changing a lot for most part of the simulation. So it's almost like having a static bias. That's why the approximation, the, uh, this approximate method works in many, many cases. But be careful, this is why we do this analysis with free energy as a function of time before, because calculating the free energy as a function of time times means looking at the bias potential and how it changes a function of time. If we want, we want to check that this bias is not changing a lot. Otherwise, this approximation for the weighting is not true. Okay. So under the assumption that the bias is not changing over time, we can use the formalism that uh, Garrett and Giovanni uh, illustrated to you, which is uh, the umbrella sampling like style of reweighting. So let's do this together. So the first thing that we need to do in exercise three is to um, reanalyze the metadynamic simulation and calculate uh, the bias potential from the complete list of Gaussian at the end of the simulation on the entire trajectory. So is it clear what you are going to do, what we are going to do? This is not the bias that was felt at that moment in the simulation where that point was produced. So we don't use the Gaussian up to that point. We use all the Gaussian that have been deposited even after we visited that point, And we reweight all the trajectory based on the value of this bias potential. So you see that this is an approximation. So we have to read the gain of the trajectory and uh, um, uh, calculate this bias potential. So let's do it. 
Oh, I have to fill again all, all these things. But I copy. I can copy, I think, all of this. So this part is exactly as the previous exercise. The difference now is here. We need a metadynamic in phi. And then what we do is, since we are rereading the file, we don't want new Gaussian to be added by this driver. And, and we make sure of this by putting the pace, a very huge number, large number, and the height to zero. And now we have to put the bias factor that we use during the simulation and the sigma value. At this point, this was as in the during the metadata simulation. The difference is here. Restart equal to yes means look for this else file, which probably is not here because we are in exercise three. I think it should be done like this. Yeah. So now we are in exercise three. It's empty. There's nothing there. We create this, PD, this uh, plumed input file and we read the hills for exercise two. So it was the old simulation, and we and we restart that. Then what we need to do is to calculate the the weights from this bias potential, and this is the umbrella sampling like formula, which means uh, the weight of it, one frame is the exponential of the value of the metadynamics bias potential in a certain point, S, divided by KBT. So the, this is pro, pro, proportional to, and this is calculated basically by this uh, reweight bias uh, uh, action. We have just to specify the metadynamics bias, which is called meta D dot bias. Once we do this, we can use all the machinery that, that Garrett explained to you to calculate histograms and free energy from a uh, metadynamic simulation. So basically, we accumulate an histogram in phi psi using the correct weight, so using this correction. And then we have some parameter about the, the, the grid they use for the histogram. And then we convert these histograms, phi and psi, to a free energy, and we print them. So. Uh, let's complete this. We need phi, psi, and the metadynamic bias on this file, every frame. Okay, is it clear? Am I, am I going too fast? It's clear. It's fine. Okay. So basically, here we do everything in this in this uh, little cell. We create the plumery weight file. Uh, up to this point, and we run the driver on the trajectory in exercise two. So we didn't run any simulation here. We just do the analysis of exercise two. And uh, we go. So it's not complaining, hopefully. OK, this is done already. It was a bit too fast. Uh, no, all the Gaussian have been read. It's always good to check the log file of plume to, to, to see if it's doing what you, you think you should do. Okay, so he's reading everything and printing out the output file. So now we can now we have we can compare the free energy as a function of phi calculated in two ways. The first one in exercise two was from the Gaussians accumulated during the simulation, so from the bias potential. In this exercise, uh, we use the bias potential to reweight the points, the trajectory, the row trajectory, calculate an histogram, and, and the free energy from the histogram. So we have two, these two different estimates of the free energy uh, as a function of phi, and we want to compare them. Because I think the question of this exercise is or was are the two free energy from directly from the metadynamics by potential and the reweighting procedure are the two free energy identical? So let's see here. Well, it looks that they are pretty similar to me. 
Did, have you tried this one and did you find these uh, similar results? Yes. Yes. No surprises for... Uh, for... Okay. It was too easy then. Okay. Do you have any question? My questions? Um, yes, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so what about, I mean, we are actually estimating the differences in the, in the minima, right? What about the transitions? What about the kinetics of the process? In this, in, this, in this moment, we are just visualizing and computing the entire free energy surface. So we have information about this transition state and the, and the minima. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's possible then with, uh, with the data that we have actually to obtain some insights in the kinetics of this, of this movement. But if you know, if you want, sorry, you, you have a thermodynamic, uh, co thermodynamic pro uh, property, which is the barrier, but you don't have the, the, the rate of interconversion between the two states because it, there's something, there's an ingredient missing. So you can, you can recover this in two ways. Uh, in, in classically, there is a variation of metadynamics, which is called infrequent metadynamics, in which you deposit your Gaussian very slowly. And from the time needed from your CV to jump during metadynamics to another basin, this is a metadynamics time, you can recover the actual time uh, of interconversion. So there is a correction factor between the metadynamics time and the, and the, and the actual time. This is the first way. The second way, which is, uh, uh, has been done a few years ago, is you estimate the um, a position dependent diffusion coefficient in these basins. And once you have this information, this is actually what, what is missing to calculate uh, using the barrier that you calculate from the free energy, the time to, to, to jump from one state to another. I can point you to the references in, uh, on Slack uh, after this uh, lecture if you want. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, I'm also interested in that. So thank you if you shared that in on his leg. <laughs> okay, I will do it. Um, can I ask something, Max? Yes, of course. Um, this assumption with using the the last bias of the entire, you know, the accumulated biases. When would that assumption break? I, I, Maybe I just don't understand. To me, it seems like you should throw away some some of the frames, at least from the beginning. Absolutely, um, good point. Uh, you 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 we we usually do that. We discard that. We we look at the at the, at the change in the in the bias potential. You can look from the how the Gaussian high are decreasing. So there is a, a initial. Uh, um, part and transient of a simulation when you see that the Gaussian high are changing a lot, which means this is it's visiting new states and the bias is certainly not converged. And then there is a moment in which the Gaussian that you had are very, very small and the estimate of the free energy is not changing a lot. So typically you would throw away the initial part, the transient and, uh, and, and reweight based on the last part. I didn't do this in this, uh, in this run because it's, <clears throat> it's very, it's very quick, this equilibri equilibration in, in uh, equivalent peptide. But usually you discard uh, some part uh, of your simulation, absolutely. Okay, so, so that is more common just to use the last one. I guess you could also use just the bias from each frame because you know this, right? All the way through. And I think you also talked about this. Uh, so hey. you, you track the Gaussians, you deposit all the way through, so you have... I guess you could bias. Uh, the, you cannot actually, uh, although there is a paper that, the, that shows you that you can, uh, because in the end, the bias potential is always increasing. It's true that it's not increasing a lot, but the bias potential is always increasing. If you, if, if you look at uh, um, from a time series that you print during the simulation. So if you just use that bias that is calculated on the fly during the simulation, you end up with the, basically the last, the very last part of the simulation that is weight a lot compared to the beginning because of a, of a, of a continuous growth of the bias. 
So you throw away a lot of points, uh, and in, if you reweight based on the on the on the on the fly bias, then very few points at the end of the simulation will count. Okay. But there is a paper that that, that they, they claim they that they can do for the system they started, okay. uh, which was published I think last year or two years ago maximum last year maybe I can I can point to that and if you remind me in the Slack channel I it's even better. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, just continuing on the on the question of Casper. Yep. Um, so when when do we know actually how to how to throw away this this section? So I mean I I assume that you would see the point in time when the Hills file appears to be not increasing very strongly, and then you throw away the frames that come from the reweighting before before you do actually the final reweighting. Is that you can, okay? You can throw away even before doing the reweighting. And let me let me quickly. Um, uh, so let me visualize this. Uh, we we have to modify a little bit. For example, this. Let's read the his files, not the color file, and time and high. Okay, this is casual. No more. Okay, let's do this uh, with line and we can. Okay, so this is how it change, how the Gaussian high is changing over time. Okay, this is the time dependence is, uh, is uh, a lot here. Uh, so when it's not changing a lot, this, uh, this, uh, and it's almost zero, this uh, Gaussian height means you're not adding, a, you're still adding, but you're not adding a lot of bias over time. So certainly in this first part, the first five nanoseconds, you see you're really putting big, huge hills. And then slowly, this Gaussian high is small, gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so if I add to this, if you have from this graph to, to pick, uh, uh, when, what to discard, I would discard the first five nanoseconds probably of the simulation or 2.5 nanoseconds. This is one way to look at it. The second way to look at it is to look really at the bias potential or equivalently at the estimate of the free energy for the bias potential. And when this is not changing a lot, it means you're not really adding a lot of bias to your simulation. So I would discard uh, here, you see a 2000 Gaussian, Still, this orange one is a little small. is is a bit different from 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 later on. So these are indicative uh, indication that can help you in deciding what to discard. Otherwise, you can you can you can try a dif different threshold and see uh, if your results are affected by the threshold. After a certain while, no, probably not. Does it make sense? Yes. Other questions? So let me um, go here. So we checked the free energy from reweighting from the bias bar identical. Now, what we want to do at this point is uh, to evaluate quantitatively the convergence by calculating, by doing the block analysis which um, Garrett explained to you. Do you need the additional explanation for this? Do you all know what we are talking about? Hello? <laughs> yeah, I think so, if nobody says anything. Okay, yes, perfect. Yes. Yeah, it's difficult to understand because I don't see you. In, uh, okay, so I, you can do it in, in, in different ways. So what I'm doing here is I, I prepared this script that is called do block fest that basically is reading the time series of phi and the weight calculated in the usual way. I'm doing this manually here so you can see the formula one, once more. I have this culver reweight that we created in exercise three in which I have uh, in column two, 
phi and column four, the bias potential. So basically I'm, I'm post-processing this file and calculating manually the printing the value of phi and the value of the bias potential and the value of the weight from the bias potential, which is this formula. It's the usual one, the exponential of the bias divided by KBT. And these are put in a phi weight file. And then these do block fast, you read this file and, and gives you a free energy in the range uh, minus pi pi with 50 beans at this uh, temperature, if you divide your simulation in uh, I blocks. And, and what we do in block analysis is calculate the free energy and the error as a function of the block size. And so this is exactly what I'm doing here. For blocks from one to 1000 dimension, every 10, I calculate the free energy and the error. So I will have many files with free energy, which is always the same, and the error which changes. So now you should look at all the errors in all the points uh, as, as they vary as a function of the block size, which is a mess. So for each file, for each free energy, I plot an average error along the profile, which is easier for me to visualize as a function of the block size. So this line is to calculate the average error along each free energy profile. So it's very stupid uh, oak command to sum the third column of this uh, file that I get at the, as output of two block fest. You can have a look, it's well documented in these files. And then I plot this as a function of the of dimension of the block. So I have to run this because it might take a couple of minutes. But in the, let me check. So we are in exercise four, probably. Okay. So each of these file, fest one, for example, when the dimension of the block is one, and you have three lines, phi, the free energy and the last column is the error in that specific point. So we can have a look actually at one very quickly. Test one. This is phi. Let me put this bigger. Okay. And then a bit too much. The third column is the error, which is very tiny. You don't even see it. But it's there. This is an error bar for each. Ah, too much. The error bar in each point of the free energy. Now you do this as a function of the block size, and then to visualize, you visualize the typical error or average error uh, on each free energy profile as a function of block size. So this is still uh, probably running. No, it's done. Okay. So this is uh, in air blocks. So I plot uh, block size uh, versus average error on the free energy profile. And this is what you see. So what did you learn from Garrett? Why in the beginning the, the error is very small? Do you know why? Correlated data. Yes. So the data from your metadata simulation are correlated data. And uh, if you take a block of dimension one, you are neglecting this correlation. So the spirit of the block analysis is instead of doing the averages with the raw data, you group the name blocks and you take the blocks as your points to do the average. And, uh, and, and you change the dimension of the block until you figure out what is the correlation between data points. So in the beginning, the block size is one. So you take the standard, the, the points as they were, uh, as we were independent and you find that's very small error. As you increase the block size and, and, uh, and, and, you, and you calculate, let's say the, 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 the variance between blocks, once you get to a point in which you exceed the correlation between the data points, you will see this error estimate to converge to a plateau. So if you see this, you are happy because it means that your simulation is long enough to decorrelate uh, the different points. This is a sign of convergence. Plus you have a second information, which is the, the value of this plateau is the typical error on the free energy profile. So you don't do much with the typical error, but now you know more or less the dimension of the block size. 
So around 400, it's, it's okay. So if you look at this file, uh, FES 400, you will see the third column is a good estimate of the error in that particular point of the free energy. So you can report in your paper the free energy and the error bar for each point for this particular block size, which is in a good regime of the correlation between points. Does it make sense? Yes. Questions? It's clear. Okay. Now, let me see if I answer to all the questions here. I calculate manually the unbiasing weight from the cold and red weight, I print them in a file, and I use the do, do block first, and here it's explained, uh, to calculate the free energy as a function of the block size and the error. Okay, so what can we say about the convergence of the metadynamic simulation? Well, we can say we have these three things. The system is very well diffusing in the, in the space. The estimate of the free energy as a function of simulation time is not changing. And we have a plateau in this uh, block analysis of, of the error. So I would say at this point, uh, we can start writing the paper because the simulation is converged. And we have an estimate of the error, which is compulsory in every figure of free energy profiles in a paper to, if it needs to be published. Okay, cool. Now we have learned everything on analyzing dipeptide. The only thing that I want to show you in exercise five is what happens when you pick the wrong collective variable. And uh, since there is no magic recipe to give you the perfect collective variable, a priori for a system, your system of interest, we need to learn how to detect problems when the CV that you chose is not great. So if we go back to exercise five, <clears throat> here I'm just saying uh, the thing that I already said. So a good CV should discriminate between the states, the relevant metal stable state of the system. Sometimes you don't know these a priori, but sometimes you know them. For example, you, we will see the exercise about uh, um, conformational change between two states, you might know the structure of the two states. So if you want to accelerate the sampling and the transition between these two states, you need a CV that is able to discriminate between these two states. Then it must include things that are very slow to equilibrate in normal molecular dynamics, because you need, for these degrees of freedom, you need the bias of metadynamics. For the others, is useless and be as small as possible because the efficiency of metadynamics design in high dimensionality is not great. Cool. Um, now, uh, what I propose to you is to play with uh, metadynamics with these three collective variables. Did you try at least one of these? Yes, but uh, I just want to inform you that there is a question in the chat. Ah, I don't see the chat. Who is asking the question? Let me check. Oh, uh, sorry, I was the one asking the question. Uh, sorry, I, I, don't, I don't have a chat. Uh, what is this? Let me see if uh, uh, you see it's, it's like hidden. Yeah. Um... So, uh, so, so, yeah. Sorry, I, you want I, me? Uh, you want me to? Uh, you want to repeat the question, or you want me to to give the answer? As you prefer. Uh, uh, either way, I, I can I can repeat the question again. Like, uh, so so the question was about like the error estimation, like in exercise four, uh, we got a plateauing uh, at the end of the. Uh, uh, yep. of that plot and like the error was like 0 0.14 kilojoule per mole. So that was actually a very small uncertainty. So I was just asking out of curiosity, like, is there a chance that the block averaging underestimates the error under a certain situation or? Um, no, if you have on this, it underestimates the error when you are in a correlated uh, regime. So this 
thing point here, but I, I will not say this is the error. So I know this is wrong. Unless, unless you're reaching a plateau area, um, I, I would not trust because it's underestimated. In this case, it's very small because the system is super simple. And mm. the collective variable that we chose is, is probably perfect ideal for this case and so we have a lot of sampling and uh, so the error is really small but we will okay. see uh, later maybe in this exercise five that if i chose another variable which is decent but not as perfect at five the error will be greater and okay. i can guarantee you that in a real application probably you will never ever have an error of 0 0.14 kj per mole it's, 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 it's impossible <laughs> Other questions? Sorry for not seeing your message. No worries. Questions? Excuse me, Max. Yes. Uh, so from the earlier simulation where we saw that uh, the uh, free energy is, is converged, the simulation is converged, would it be fair to arrive at free energy as a function of psi Using the earlier trajectory, I can I cannot hear you very well. Can uh, Can you repeat the question, please? Okay. So the in exercise four uh, we have seen that the simulation is converged. Yes. And uh, I was just wondering if we can calculate free energy as a function of psi. Of course. Yes. Using that trajectory. Yes. And uh, put through put that through all the convergence tests that, that we have done so far. You and you you can calculate the free energy as a function of any variable. Yes, because psi is not convert. Sorry, because psi was not the variable which is biased. The yeah, absolutely. Actually, the the the, the origin of the of the, the the idea, the motivation to do the weighting came from the fact that we want to calculate free energy, not from the variable of metadynamic using metadynamics because we have the bias, that was 2008, but from other variables. For example, most typically, what, what when I do a simulation, I want to compare the result with experimental data. And the experimental data can be a function of the coordinates of the system that are not used as a metadynamic CV. So the, the, the original motivation, if you go back and look in a paper from 2009-2010, was to link our temper metadynamic simulation to experiments. And, uh, and so we, had, we needed a method to obtain free energy and statistics on the variable that we did not include in metadynamics CVs. So this is how it was born, let's say, the, the, the motivation to, to develop the weighting. But then, uh, the variable for metadynamics is exactly a variable as, as all the others. So you can do reweighting even on the on the variable that you used for metadynamics uh, acceleration, let's say. <clears throat> Does yes. it, did, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, this part of it, I was already aware, I, uh, I, because that was uh, uh, mentioned by, mentioned in the last class, uh, that, it's possible to do reweighting and derivative free energy as a function of other collective variable. My question was, uh, uh, can I confidently say that the free energy profile that we arrive using reweighting would be all would also be converged? Because you're calling uh, phi to be a good variable for sampling after putting through all this test. Now, if I Reweight and arrive at free energy as a function of psi. Would that profile be converged? Can, can I be confident of that? Or uh... yeah, you can try, but yes, because okay. in this in this case, phi is uh, let's say that that follow phi. The phi is the actual degrees of freedom which is important to to accelerate. It's okay. interesting okay. to see what happens if you don't accelerate phi, but you accelerate psi and you reweight psi or you use the bias for psi and then you will notice is what I, i'm starting doing in a few minutes but you see clearly that is not converged because you picked the wrong variable okay better okay. yeah thank you okay 
other questions? No. Can you switch off the microphone, please, if we don't have other questions? Perfect. Um, so I propose these three variables to use for the, your metadynamic simulation. Beta hydra, phi, phi, psi, sorry, <laughs> the radius of generation of the distance between uh, two atoms. Who tried at least one of these? Don't be shy. Nobody. I, I did. I did. I know that somebody tried something. I, I saw the Slack channels. Yeah, okay. that was me. <laughs> you tried Psi. I tried uh, Psi, the radius of generation, and the um, distance as well. Okay, good. Then I will go back to you after I show you uh, my. I tried only one, Psi. Uh, did somebody else try Psi? Um, yeah, I tried Psi too. Okay. Yeah. Me too. And Perfect. Radius. Yeah. Good, very good. So you can already tell me which is the worst possible of these three. Any idea? The distance one. Okay. Yeah, for me also the, the distance, but I didn't get any good results for the others. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're all bad. Huh? Yeah. Okay. So let, let's show for the people who didn't do, didn't try any of those, what happens when you use Psi, for example, which is this input file. Now they are all completed, so we, we, are, we go a little bit faster. Uh, exercise 5, bad CV. Uh, it's exactly like before, like, but we have Psi here. Okay, it's very simple. So I don't need to do anything. I do this, but it's useless. Uh, now I run the simulation. What I'm printing now, I'm visualizing now, is the, the evolution, time evolution of phi, not of psi, of phi. And uh, here we go. So if you remember, phi has two states, minus three, minus one, and around one. This is same length, 20 uh, nanoseconds. And you see in these 20 nanoseconds, it happens once that Phi jumps to the to the other basin. So this is really bad. Let's see what happens to Psi. Psi moves a lot actually, but 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 it's not enough. So it's boosted the the, the, the sampling of Psi. But but since there is one degrees of there is one slow mode that is missing, Phi has no effect. The bias, the acceleration of Psi has no effect to the to what is actually important, which is phi. So you see here, you have just this event. Okay, but we, we, we do exactly the same procedure, uh, reweighting and block analysis on this trajectory. And we see how we can, from this analysis, how we can understand that it's not converged. Um, so this is, I have everything in one shot. So I create the reweighting file. I post-process the trajectory. I create the weight file and I do the blocks. So at the end of this cell, hopefully it's fast, we will have the block analysis for Psi. And we will compare with the previous one. Did you, did you follow the people who tried other variables? Did you follow these, um, uh, did you do these steps? And um, yes. 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 Okay. So what did you find out from the error analysis? Did it look like this? No. No, not at all. No, no. Completely different. Okay. Let's see if it's done. Sorry, it will take probably Still a few seconds. I want to check. This is exercise five, bad CV. Oh, it's almost done. I, I extended the block size to 5,000. It's even, it's even long, it's even bigger, the block, uh, but every 50 st uh, steps. So it's okay, it's done. Perfect. Yes. Okay, so same plot as before. 
ah, now you see it's completely different. So before we ended that 1,000 probably the block size. And 1,000 was already very well uh, at the plateau. Here, even for, for, for dimension of 5,000 points, still it's, 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 it's trying to reach this famous plateau and the error is pretty big. So what does this mean? It means that in the, the simulation will converge even if the CV is very bad because of all simulation eventually converge. It just, it will need a much longer simulation time because here we are still in the regime in which we are decorrelating between the points. So we can, if you want to try, you can go up to, to, to bigger block sizes, but it's clear that the simulation will take much longer to converge because in this 20 nanoseconds, we observe just one transition between the metastable states of alanine black type. So hopefully this is what you observe uh, also with the other variables, unless you never observe this transition. Is this the case? For example, using the distance of radius of generation, have you ever never observed a transition or you observe maybe one or two transitions? Can, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, the, the, the thermostat we are using, is it a deterministic one? Uh... Because my, I don't, I don't remember. My this this uh, graph you're showing here, what I did looks almost exactly the same. So probably. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Good. So you know it. Uh, we both know it. It's, it's consistent. We don't know if it's right, but it's consistent. Yeah. Yeah, but the seed is embedded in the topology. All the seeds and the random numbers, blah blah blah, generate are embedded in the TPR file. So we are probably using exactly the same thing. Other observations? Did you find something similar when you did your uh, error block analysis on the other variables? Um, so for me, the, the distance one, I, I did the simulation didn't run through. So it gave me link errors because the okay. system constraints blew up. Uh, I don't remember for the gyration. I think it, it definitely didn't converge. Um, I can okay, check. so it might happen that, that pushing on the hydrogen, adding bias to an hydrogen atom is not a good idea because these are, are, are constrained to be close to, to another heavy atom. So maybe this was not a great suggestion for me because it, it might happen that if you push on an hydrogen, you 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 disturb a little bit the constraint. And the register of generation behave uh, like this, more or less. Mm, I think so. I, I would have to check. I just remember it did not converge. OK, good. So the worst possible scenario as we were discussing on Slack, is not when you see one of these uh, clearly rare events and then you don't see it anymore, but this is a sign that, that the simulation is, uh, is the CV as something not great, but when you see something... Um, Converged. Sorry? Ah, no, that when you see something converged, like that it appears that it's converged. Yes, sorry, I'm trying to find the right, the right starting point here. But I'm, I'm, no, I'm doing something wrong. Um, if you see basically staying in one basin um, without never observing a transition that, and you don't know anything about your system, uh, this for you might look converged because you have seen uh, everything in the in the subset of the state that you visited, you visit multiple times all the all the conformation. So this is the, the worst possible case because it's very difficult to to detect uh, that you never visit a state that you never visit. So the, the only way to detect this is to try to 
do an independent simulation from a completely different conformation or as different as possible. And you might have a chance to detect this problem because you start from another place in the universe and maybe it's a place that you never visited or connected to the space you never visited before. But this is the worst possible situation, at least for me. <clears throat> um, sorry, I, I checked and um, it's, I, I don't know if I did everything correctly, but it actually goes up and then it seems to go down a bit again. So it, it shows a kink and then um, goes um, a bit down. It becomes it, noisy or it goes down? It becomes So it both, it becomes noisy and seems to go down. Maybe <laughs> I, I only did it for 1000 block size. So maybe because of the noise, it seems to go down, but... The noise is normal because when you have big, uh, large block uh, sizes, it means you have fewer blocks. It means you have calculating the variance of, uh, from of, the, of the averages using fewer data points, which means it will be more noisy. But that, this usually happens in the very uh, right end of this plot that I, here I'm not, I'm not showing it. Uh, and even here in the in the good simulation, you see a little bit of this. As the block size increases, you start seeing a little bit of a, of a, of noise. But if you go to I don't know five five thousand here, probably you will see oscillation. But the important this is normal. The important thing is you, you have a regime in which you have a plateau before the noise. Other questions. because we have exercise six, which is a bit longer. So I want to go fast there. Um, so this is clearly a sign that the CV is not well chosen. Now, I, I, I was proposing also, can you think of a different CV that is as good or kind of as good as, uh, as the Daedra Phi? Have you tried this? I give you 30 seconds to think while I drink, I drink some water. Nobody found a CV as good as five. I don't believe it. I tried with that combination. So adding bias over the two collected variables, phi and psi. Ah, oh, this is too easy. Yeah. No, you use you you you, <laughs> you hide phi uh, with psi. No, no, this will work. No, yeah. just one, just one as good or kind of good as phi. Nobody. Okay, let's reopen the slides. Can you see them? Yes. Okay, so what I tried is these fancy variable, which are called path collective variables, which gives you, um, they are usually comes in pairs and they describe a, a conformational change between two states, A and B. And the variable are, you start from uh, whatever initial uh, idea of the pathway between A and, and B. It can be a morphine, interpolation, whatever you, you like. It's not the right one, certainly. And the variables uh, uh, map a configuration of the system in terms of the distance of the progress along this path from A to B, which is this red line in the bottom. So the progress and Z is S and Z is the distance of the path from your configuration. So you have two reference points, A and B, and your configuration is the progress along the path from A to B and the distance from the path. So this can be used if you have knowledge of a, of a start and of a starting point and ending point of your uh, reaction, let's say. In this case, uh, I gave you the PDB and the topology file and the PDB on the two states. So what you can do is create uh, this kind of path variable between A and B, which is a re this weird formula. So what I tried is a poor man version of this path, which has just two frames, state A and state B. 
So this formula simplified a lot. And this uh, square here is the RMSD. Basically, this variable calculates the RMSD of a configuration with respect to state A, the RMSD with respect to state B, and it tells you which is the closest and associate with either A or B. It's a poor man path, just two frames. Okay, is it clear? You can have a look at the, this very old paper if you want. But very nice. Okay, so I use just this progress variable with two frames, A and B. And I created this fancy input file in which, well, I load the RMSD, I create the RMSD with respect to state A. And I use just the backbone atoms of alanine bipeptide and then of state B. And that's it. And then I combine, you know, you can define whatever you want as collective variable directly in the plumed input file with custom. Custom takes the two RMSD and they applied this fancy function, which if you look carefully, is exactly this path variable with two conformations. And you have a parameters, if you look at the manual for plumed, that more or less you estimate based on the distance between the frame, so the distance between A and B. Uh, so here you have, uh, you, 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 you work with two RMSDs. And this variable goes from one when you are, you are in state A to two when you are in state B, super simple. And then you do metadynamics in this variable. And at the same time, I print the value of phi epsi so I can keep track of, of what we have analyzed so far. This is all new. Now, this is the value of S during this simulation. So you start with one and then you stay here a bit and then you jump toward two and you go back and then you go back and forth. Not as efficiently as, as phi before, because you remember it was a continuous transition between the two states. Still in this 20 nanosecond, you see six, uh, 10 uh, events, 10 transition between the two states, which is not bad. Now, this is S, this special path variable. But if we look at the old phi, you can see that every time you see this transition to two, you are closer to our uh, to the end point of our path, which is exactly the state B of our peptide. So every time you see a transition in this graph, there is a transition in phi. So here in the 20 nanosecond I'm simulating, I'm seeing multiple transition uh, uh, of uh, my slow variable, which is good, which is okay. It's not as good as phi, but it's decent. So we do all the usual analysis, always the same thing, that you reload the bias potential, you do the block analysis, and I run this, <clears throat> and we see, and we try to comment of the error as a function of a block size. In the meantime, if you want to tell me your efforts or what you tried and didn't work, please don't be shy. No effort, no trials. Okay, not a problem. Okay, this should be... I mean, yeah. I mean the, the path collective variable is a little bit fancy for, for this part because, no, I have checked that before and I didn't think of that because I, th I think you have this lambda function to optimize. And for example, I saw that in Plumet, you also need this multiple stuff and you need like a wingle some t. So I was like, yes, this, this seems a little bit painful. <laughs> I mean, let's go for something a little bit less sophisticated. No, no, I agree. For alanine bipeptide, maybe it's too much. That's why I created the, I, I tried the, 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 fence, the Pullman version in which you have two frames. And the only, the lambda parameter is very simple because it's a function of the RMSD between the two frames. So it's, it's, it's easier than you think. Uh, but yes, it's, 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 it's fancy. Uh, okay, good CV. Here we go. What do you think about this plot? There are two, two things to notice. I mean, between 2,000 and 3,000 seems converged. Sorry? 
between 2000 and 3000 kind of has the idea of seeing converge yeah yeah it's it, after 2000 i would say then you start having this noise but you, you see a plateau here and what is uh, w- w- when it this plateau is happening with compared to the uh, using phi much later for block sizes uh, much larger because do you remember the the first analysis we stopped at 1000 as block size and we already seen the plateau so it means that this takes more time to do transition between two states so they are more correlated in this in this sense because because it takes more time to to jump between the, the two states so you have fewer recrossing events still we are able to decently calculate the free energy and what is the second thing that you notice in this plot can i ask is is this the error on s or phi no this is on phi we did all very weight this is on phi. phi okay yes but then the i think the obvious thing is that the error is much larger of course that is that is exactly this is the point uh, this is the point that I want to. to this is, uh, it takes more time to have an estimate, reasonable estimate of free energy with this plateau in the error. Uh, but also, the plateau is a different value, 0.6 kJ per mole. Okay. And it makes sense. It's like we have fewer recrossing between the points. Uh, we have, uh, and, and, um, and the error in the estimated free energy is larger. So to, to get to 0.14, maybe we, we have to run much, 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 much longer to observe all the transition that we observe when we use phi as collective variable. Does it make sense? But in a, yes. But in, a, in an actual uh, uh, application, already having uh, an error of 0.6 kJ per mole and observing this plateau, maybe when you are studying the transition, uh, conformational changes of a protein with 300 residues, this is already a huge success. It is not for our dipeptide, but it's okay. Other questions? Um, sorry. Um, maybe maybe I missed it, but um, I was wondering um, why using the RMSD as a, as a collective variable wasn't a good idea or whatever. I mean, I, I don't know if you, you mentioned it. I might have missed it. Um, well. No, I didn't mention it. It might work. It, in, in, it actually, what I did is, is a combination of RMSDs. Yeah that tells you where are you compared to these two reference points. But maybe the RMSD alone, because the system is very small, it's enough to push away from state A. There's nothing more away from state A than state B. So probably it's enough an RMSD with one or respect to one of the two structures. I haven't tried that. It's a good, it's a good point. Okay, I, I will try it. Thank you. Let me know on Slack how it goes. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Other points? Um, I have another question that is a little bit uh, tangential. Go ahead. Um, we, we discussed about the pace, and I think this works actually for normal force fields where we have this shake thingy that helps us to, to set the time step to two femtoseconds, right? But what about when you use hydrogen mass repartitioning or when you use a Martini force field that is like 20 femtoseconds, do we also use the same pace? Do we modify that? I usually keep this one. Uh, you can play a, a little bit, a little bit with the with the pace. Is not is uh, it's affecting the initial part of the simulation. It will, it's it's critical, I think, when you have. Uh, a more complex system uh, simulated uh, not at classical or coarse grade level, but at, at um, uh, ab initio level, like chemical reaction, in which you, you never observe many transition between reactor uh, the, between the reactor and product, or you see maybe two or three, and maybe optima if you're lucky, and maybe optimizing exactly this transient period is uh, is uh, is uh, is more important. Here we count on, on observing several events, and if you delay by 10, 20 percent uh, uh, these initial transient, you make longer or shorter by changing the pace. Uh, it's, it's not uh, dramatic, I think. 
Mm, okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have another question regarding this era, uh, Max. Um, yes. So maybe it's a stupid question, but to me, it seems like that the error should converge to the same error in a long time scale limit. And to me, it's a little bit weird that it doesn't. Um, if if you simulate it for a really long time, even though you chose a bad collective variable, you should in the end, by you know, maybe it's like forever, like the time scale of the universe you simulate, but in theory, right, you should converge to the same. It it will converge. It it will converge to a zero error in, in the infinite time scale statistical error when you have an error of a force field. But here we have a fixed yeah. simulation time in which, uh, and you have two states and a fixed simulation time. In one simulation, you observe one thousand of these recrossing event between the two states. Okay, yeah. and and in the other you observe five. So yeah. it's like a, making an average of, of, of five points because what counts is more or less, uh, who cares of the fluctuation inside the basins because these are correlated data points. What, it, what, what matters is when you completely jump to another state, then you have an independent point. So it's like doing an average with five points in the second run and with 1,000. At fixed simulation time, of course, the two, uh, the two arrows will be different. Because it's like having effectively here a shorter simulation time. Yeah. Because you see you've seen fewer events. But in the end, they will converge the at zero error in the infinite time limit. It's just the, the rate of convergence which is different. Could this maybe explain why one of the other students saw it go down again? I mean, no, that doesn't this is a function of the block size, isn't it? Or yes, it's... exactly. No, uh, that so I think does, is no, that doesn't it's numerical, it's even bugs or more likely yeah, numerical yeah. noise. Okay, so you, you divide by the number of blocks here also, so you get zero in the infinite number of blocks, you get zero. It's like a standard error of the mean. Yes. Yeah, okay. It is, it is the, the uh, yes, it's exactly this. It's just weighted because the, the blocks are, are, are weighted differently as using the metadynamics uh, uh, Waiting, yeah, okay. and just just that. Other questions? Okay, we have twenty minutes. I think maybe we can do it in even less. Exercise six. It was something a bit more complex, apparently more complex, uh, which is a conformational change uh, between two completely different states. And this is a real uh, biological system. Uh, this, this nice protein, the C-terminal domain of this nice protein, when it is attached to the rest of the protein, it stays in these alpha helical conformations. When for some reason it is detached, it assumes a completely different form. So alpha helix to a beta sheet form. So the question is, let's study this conformational change with metadynamics and let's give the free energy difference between these two states. So who managed to, to do this? This is complicated. And if you did, give me a number. What is the free energy difference between the two states? Don't be shy. I mean, I tried, but no. Good. Let, if you want to tell us about your efforts, what did you try? What CVs you try? Which problem did you have? Uh, perhaps someone else, just give me a second in order to get the, the files. Sure. And nobody, nobody obtained a number at the end of the day. Okay, we will do it together. Second question, at least would you be able to see these two states during the simulation? Because the starting point was a kind of an unfolded conformation. Did you manage to, to, to find out the, the conformation in the two PDB files of the two states or not even that? It's 
So um, I tried um, end-to-end distance. Yeah. Uh, radius of gyration. Yes. And um, RMSD. And um, distance, end-to-end distance and radius of gyration gave me nothing discernible. Yes. Um, um, RMSD maybe a little bit, but uh, not nothing to get me encouraged enough to... Which RMSD did you use? I uh, used the full RMSD on the um, uh, R reference structure, but I did it with um, MD trash. And I'm not sure if I uh, realigned it uh, properly. I, I, the time was a bit limited, so I did it a okay. bit. Okay, this was a lot, this long. It took uh, me five or six hours of simulation to complete this. That's yeah. why Garrett should have told you, I think he, he did, to start this exercise as soon as possible. Yes, yes. So that was my observation, um, basically. Okay. Other efforts? Should I should I start? Or we are waiting for. Okay, if you want to stop me and, and show me your effort in the meantime, you can you can anytime. Okay, so the trick here is uh, uh, my suggestion. Any CV, any CV natively implemented in Plume can be used. So the simplest of all is the RMSD with respect to one state or the other. Also, the second suggestion is choose maximum three CVs. And um, so probably one was not enough. Uh, in fact, I used two collective values. One is RMSD with respect to state A, and the other is RMSD with respect to state B. And if you look at the and another suggestion was there. In any case, you have to monitor the RMSD with respect to the two conformations. So you already have to monitor it. Why don't you use it as metadynamic CVs? And uh, I, you have to look at the RMSD page to see how you have to prepare the RMSD PDB files for reference, because there is a special operation to do, which is to mark which atoms you want to use for alignment and computation of the RMSDs. Um, it's in the page. So what I did is uh, I took just the C alpha from the PDB that I uh, include in the GitHub, and I defined two RMSDs with respect to state A and B after optimal alignment. And that's it. I did the two-dimensional metadynamic simulations for a very long time using the grid and using a huge bias factor because my suggestion here is due to the nature of a force field, we are simulated at a physical temperature of 60K. So be ready to test large values of a bias factor. And indeed, if you use a, a bias factor of a too small bias factor, you never observe transition between the two states. This was all, all also to show you the effect of the bias factor. So let's do this. I did already the simulation, I have just to calculate the free energy as a function of RMSD with respect to A and B. Hopefully this is done very quickly. Um, okay, let me check. Exercise six. Uh, yeah, I have everything I need. So maybe while uh, this will take let me see how many of these Gaussian. Half a million. Well, yes, it was a few hours of simulations. So you did use the RMSD, but it, it didn't work. Just the RMSD alone. I uh, did an unbiased run. And yes. I noticed I couldn't uh, see, see a, a, well, it, it, it was maybe a little bit, but it did, didn't give me the confidence to, to start running bias simulations. Okay. So, uh, yeah. I would say also the similar case as Simon. So I ran a non-bias simulation for 30 nanoseconds. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I, well, my idea was try to have the same approach as before, right? Like run a non-bias simulation, see the sigmas, and kind of have an idea on that. Yep. But for example, I had the problems with the alpha RMSD and beta RMSD, which were the, my initial ideas. And I yes. then was like, mm -hmm. okay, maybe this does not work for this type of systems. 
And RMSD also did not give me a lot of hint to actually use that one because I know that RMSD is a little bit degenerate for this type of systems when they are quite large. True. Yeah, this is true. There was another uh, indication that the RMSD could have been uh, a good CV hidden, which is this one. We are simulating the system using a simplified structure based potential called smog. Uh, if you click on smog, if you don't know what it is, but you click on smog, you see how this potential is built. It's a very simple potential. This, by definition, you provide two minima in the two comfort. Actually, it provides one minima in the conformation that you provide to the server. So you upload to the server a PDB and uh, it will construct an Hamiltonian, a uh, force field that will have a very nice funnel energetically that goes in this uh, uh, minimum. So this uh, uh, topology file that I sent you is a modification of smog uh, to have two minimum, two nice funnel that goes in state A and state B. So variable like the RMSD that maybe in real cases are suboptimal if the system in B is big. Here they work because the, the, the free energy surface is a bit simplified by getting rid of all, everything non-native that can be formed during the simulation. Okay, this is, uh, this is done. So we calculated the free energy and, and now I can plot the time evolution of the, hopefully, of the RMSD. So now I have two RMSD from state A and from state B. And if you see during the the simulation, you repeatedly visit both states. This RMSD goes to 0 0.1, probably, okay? And of course, when one is low, the other is, is big because they cannot be the same structure uh, at the same time, two different structures at the same time. So this is a decent corrective variable because you are exploring the two states repeatedly during the simulation. Now I want to show you, so we take, I take the bias potential of metadynamics and I plot the free energy as a function of these two variables. Just to show you that you can make really nice plots with the metadynamics. So this is RMSD from state A and this is from state B. And you clearly see this minimum, which is state A. And you see a little bit, another minimum, which is less populated. This is state B. And this, if you remember the story, because I, I told you the biological story, not uh, because it was nice, this state, um, which is this, the helical one, is the state that the system adopts when it is attached to the partner. When it's not attached to the partner, it is stayed in this beta barrel conformation. If you look at the free energy, now we are simulating just this piece alone. So there's no uh, the black, uh, gray partner of this, uh, of this protein. So the, the system stays a little bit in the two, but it prefers a lot of the state of the right, which is state A, the barrel. So this is reflecting the free energy. We are not in the presence of the partner. So yes, it populates a little bit the alpha helix, but it is mostly a beta sheet because it should be like this. Does it make sense? Questions? Yes. Okay. So this, <coughs> sorry. In these two variables, it converge, it converges the simulation. You just have to, to use a very high uh, bias factor. But you see the barriers are of the order of uh, 40 kJ per mole, which is, which is a lot, sorry. So this might have, uh, could be a, a difficulty in the simulation. Um, one question, Max. Yep. Um, I mean, we know this a priori, but how can we actually know if we need to to improve this type, this bias factor for this type of systems? Uh, usually, you start with uh, with uh, atomistic force field around 10, 12, and then if you see that nothing happens, so you visit very local uh, area around your starting point, you start increasing. Uh, but uh, usually it's not something you play a lot. It's something between 10, maximum 15 should be, should be okay. Here it was, it was a, it's a different force field, it's a different uh, uh, landscape. And I warn you that you, um, you, you needed a higher bias factor to complete the exercise. 
other questions? Sorry, I cannot really follow also Slack. I'm, I'm, I see messages, but I cannot. If 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 a person who posted on Slack was as a question, I, he can uh, or she can. Uh, I'm trying to monitor everything, but it's difficult. It's it's not meant for a question right now, but thanks. Okay, okay. I will have a look later. Ah, thank. Okay, perfect. Excuse me, Max. Yep. This is not a question. I just have a comment to make. As I mentioned in the Slack uh, a few hours ago, yep. I, have, uh, I have set up a simulation with uh, a similar corrective variables, RMSD with respect to state A and uh, yes. with respect to state B. Yes. And there, uh, the slight difference from what you have chosen is uh, I have picked all the backbone atoms, not just C alpha atoms, in the definition of uh, my yes. RMSDs, uh, both for alignment as well as calibrating RMSD. Yes. Uh, so I have started to see uh, transitions from one state to another, but uh, uh, somehow I, I, I chose a very low bias factor value, which is why I am not seeing uh, sufficient transitions even after uh, running twenty even after running the simulation for twenty nanoseconds. Okay, but you so were on the right factor, track. You were on the yeah. right track. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, I had used uh, the same collective variables for a different system where uh, I was trying to study the conformation landscape of a monomer which has both folded and unfolded conformations. And uh, there it worked out pretty well for me. Yeah, be careful that the RMSD for describing unfolded state is not really the best possible collective variable because it's, 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 there is a problem with the RMSD which is a huge degeneracy uh, at large values of the RMSD. So when the RMSD is close to zero, then you are sure that the, the to a particular value of the RMSD correspond very similar structure. When you have the RMSD of 100, you have the protein universe at the same distance uh, of 100 angstrom. So be careful to describe a, a disorder state with RMSD. Here it's, it's very easy because uh, you have two order but different structure and you use two RMSD. So it works well because it's either one or the other and you push the system to go through the, uh, uh, in between the two. Yes, yes, I, I see your point, but uh, that system is not actually a protein. It's a small uh, a supramolecular monomer, which has around uh, 50, 60 atoms. Okay, uh, but if the... it work, I trust you, if it works for you, it's just for, for big proteins is, is a more problematic. Yes, 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 I understand. So here uh, uh, there's no, not much of a degeneracy that's present in the extended confirmation. Other questions? Um, do you have suggestion for disordered proteins then? Is that context or context or for disordered for, protein? For disorder I can I can point you if you're not aware of. We have a repository of uh, of uh, uh, called Nest of uh, example of Pluminitude file for certain problems. So we have uh, now 129 examples. So if you type, I think L. Uh, you have uh, CVs for uh, study amyloid beta 42, which is a disorder system of 42 residues. So you can have a, a look at the CVs that we use in that paper. Awesome, thanks. I didn't know that. I should have talked about this probably in the first slide, first lecture. Other question? We have five minutes. I want to show you one quick thing. There is a microphone on. So I skip uh, the, the boring part of the error analysis. It's boring, but you need to do. And the block analysis, this is something that needs to be done. I want to show you something slightly different, which is uh, something to address this question, which was optional. Report structure and population of the most significant uh, populated states. So one way to do this, is uh, once you've done your uh, convergence analysis and you have the weights for each conformation, you can use any type of clustering approach that you want. So to really group uh, the conformation in similar, uh, um, uh, in groups of similar conformation, for example, using this tool of Gromax, if you're familiar with, it's called GMX cluster, then hopefully it will be done quickly. So this is 
uh, just going through your trajectory and, and, and separating the different conformation in groups based on a certain cutoff. Here is free Armstrong on the backbone. Everything that is within free Armstrong from the backbone, calculated on the backbone, is considered as, a, as an equivalent conformation. The problem is once you do this, you have a list of clusters and the population, but this population is not calculated correctly because you, you doesn't, Promax knows anything about the metadynamics weight and the weighting. So once you do this, always remember to correct for the uh, fact that you were doing a bias simulation. So you need to recalculate the population of this cluster by summing the weights of the frames, which are member to a specific cluster. So this is what I, I maybe we don't have enough, a lot of time to, to show you this, but basically, now it should be done quickly, the cluster analysis. Cluster analysis produces a file with a definition of cluster with the member of the cluster. So what you need to do is take each cluster and instead of looking at the population that Gromax is telling you, which is wrong, you have to sum the weights of the conformation that belongs to this cluster. And the weights are defined as we did uh, today in all the other lectures as uh, from the Metadynamics bias potential, sorry. Is it clear? This is a general message. When you do cluster analysis with any tool you like, you will have a list of clusters with the population. Remember to unbias the population of this cluster. And this is a simple script for people who use Gromax that reads this not so user-friendly output file in which you have all the clusters defined and Reweight based on the metadynamics bias. So at the end, hopefully, it will be done soon with clustering because it takes some time. Um, at the end, you will have a list, uh, a new list of clusters with the correct population of free energy. So in the meantime, I will show you, I will answer to the question I've asked what is the difference in free energy between the two states? So the distance, the difference was, I think, around 30 k per mole or something like this. You, we can judge this in these two ways. We look at the free energy with respect to RMDs. So you have this state at zero and this state around, uh, I don't know, 30, 32, 33. So we have to, to look really at the data. Here is just a plot. So this is uh, from this uh, analysis. And it's a good estimate because at this value of RMSD, there's no much variability. We are at RMSD zero from state B, so it's basically conformation B, and same in these regions. So these variables are good CVs because they can separate and identify, identify state A and B. So the difference in free energy between the two conformation is roughly exactly 34. 34. Max. Now, yeah. Just one question on that plot. So can I say that the yellow area is the minimum free energy path? I should go from this way, yes. But is uh, I cannot see clearly. Here there is just a, a faint, very faint trace of a, of, a, of a free energy path to go from one state to another. Probably the system goes that, that way to, to transition from A and B, yes. There are more rigorous way to given this free energy to relax the path, a minimum free energy path on this, uh, on this uh, surface. I'm not sure we have uh, implemented them in, in Clued as a post-processing tool. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So now we did this clustering. If you're familiar with Gromax, you know what it comes out of this is a list of cluster called cluster.log in which you have this kind of definition. We have 1,580 clusters. Cluster one has 400 structures uh, and this is a list of structure of, of frames in your trajectory that belong to this, to this cluster. And then if you go down, you have cluster two and so on and so forth. So in order to be meaningful, this number, which is the population of the cluster, so 400 conformation out of one, out of uh, I don't know how many, um, you have to reweight for the metadynamics weight, the exponential, blah, blah, blah. 
So this can be done a posteriori. And this is what I'm doing here at the end. I read the call value weight where there is bias information. I read the cluster.log where there are the cluster, uh, the definition of a cluster, and I do all the reweighting. So I calculate the correct population of the clusters. So if I do this and I print out basically a dictionary with ordered from the most important cluster, which is cluster one, and this is the free energy around 9.88. Uh, and then you, you go to higher cluster, higher free energy cluster, until you get to, uh, if I remember correctly, cluster two. Cluster two is state B. Cluster one is exactly state A. Things in between are things in the transition, in the, in the things that we were talking about, in the path between A and B. So our regions uh, at intermediate free energy between the state A and state B. And then you fall down in the, in, the, in the helical structure, which is the cluster number two, which has free energy 34. Uh, so the difference actually between the two is 24, is not 34. The difference in free energy between state one and state two. Let's see if it's consistent with this. I don't understand. It's in this region, probably. It should be consistent. Calculating or using the clustering or using this collective variable, you should give the same answer. So one thing to notice, and then I'm, I'm, I'm done, and you can ask a question if you want. So one, because it was the most populated according to Gromax. The second cluster, according to Gromax, Gromax was the number 278. So if you don't account for the bias potential of metadynamics, what is actually the second most populated cluster was around 300. So you see, if you account for the metadynamics weight, the cluster population change. And what was, uh, apart from the first one, which actually was the top most populated before the weighting and after the weighting. So here you have uh, a certain number of cluster. You can look at the PDB because Gromas give you the PDB of a representative of a cluster and you have a free energy associated to the cluster. Questions? Hello? Uh, no, for the moment, no. I, I am still processing this last part. It's actually quite nice. Uh, I assume that the cluster one should have a value of zero, right? And everything would be shifted down. These numbers may have, uh, have no meaning. Yeah, 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 I know what you mean. It's just, you can you can offset by anything, any any value. What is, what is, uh, what is important is the different in, difference in free energy between the states. So here I, 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 I put at zero, the minimum. Here it didn't come out that way. Other questions? Hi. Um, Hi. I, uh, I have a question about the bias factor. Um, so as far as I understood, for a lot of systems, um, what it was proposed, it was like to check different bias factors and see if transitions were observed and so on. But I was wondering um, what to do if we expect like maybe a larger, uh, larger energy barriers separating our relevant states and also like how to, est to make uh, an estimate um, instead of, yeah, instead of uh, going and trying different ones, an initial estimate. So, uh, sorry, I hope I made myself. Yeah, clear. it's 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 very it's very difficult to to be one hundred percent sure. Uh, so I don't have a magic recipes. Um, the thing that you can do, you don't have to throw away all your simulation. If you start from a very from a, if you start from a bias factor that to be is inadequate for your problem, which means you don't see things happen. You don't see jump into a completely different state or you're not visiting what you, you would expect. Uh, what you can do, you can change it on the fly. You don't need to, to, to restart from scratch your simulation. You just change, you, you stop your simulation and you change this value and you restart your simulation. So you it will somehow correctly take into account of the bias that you have deposited up to that point. And this is the only thing that, that that I can suggest, but in practice, it almost never happened to me to have to play a lot with the bias factor, except for in the exercise number six, 
which took me a while to, to find out a, an optimal bias factor. So I had to play with two or three values because I started with a classical 10 and nothing happened. And then I, I observed one transition. And if you observe one transition, more or less, you have an idea of a barrier from the, from the metadynamic, from the potential that we put it up to this point. So that could be a, a, a suggestion. Even if it's not converged, when you first go out of a minimum, you have a rough idea of a barrier. And if your bias factor was not good for that barrier, you can increase it. What if you know the energy from experiment or something? You said, said the bias factor is like a temperature. Could yes. you then? It's, 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 it's like a fictitious temperature of a, of a CV, which you're sampling which is connected to the, to the barrier that you want to easily jump in your, uh, in your, in your simulation. So if you have information, any type of information, of course, you, you can use it to more or less broadly tune the bias factor, yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit hard because how do you then know if the experiment is probing the same CV exactly as... No, 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 I, I, I yeah. agree, it's very, very, it's very rough. But I, I, for many, uh, majority of biological application is not, is, that's not the problem. The choice of bias factor is not the problem. The problem is I've been devising good CVs that can describe your, 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 your problem and your different states. And we will probably organize in the maybe next year or in September more advanced uh, classes to, to explain how to use a bit more sophisticated variable, machine learning style variable. And so you can see more um, uh, other ways to, to address the problem without you thinking, but the machine thinking for them. Other questions? If you're okay with you, I will stop this sharing on YouTube and you can ask other questions that you want to, to ask public publicly. <laughs>